Yes, thank you. Um, I don't have a that loud voice, so I hope you can hear me. Um, Stephanie asked me to talk a little bit about my dissertation, uh, which I finished uh, last year, uh, which was on the audiovisual heritage uh, domain uh, in Holland, uh, where we already have centralized a lot of our content into one uh, organization. Um, I want to change this perspective uh, from, uh, from the organization's perspective to a, a user perspective. And, um, well, a focal point we hear from this morning on was about uh, digitization, um, especially within the audiovisual uh, heritage domain. A little, much focus is, uh, went to the preservation, um, so digiti digitization enables the, the preservation and conservation for future generation. Um, but I want to change the focus uh, from that to um, the distribution of the audiovisual uh, content. And uh, I have a couple of reasons why I want to change uh, this focus. Um, first of all, I think uh, nowadays consumer technology is there for distribution. Um, a lot of, especially here in Western countries, a lot of um, people have broadband access. So uh, basically there's, there's no hindrance anymore. Um, second, um, it's an important uh, for the um, European uh, agenda, the digital agenda. Uh, there's a quote uh, of Nelly Cruz, who's vice president of this digital agenda. Digitization brings culture into people's homes. So I, think, I really think we should strive to, the, to get there. Uh, another point is that it's often a uh, vocal point of an important reason for, um, or, or for governmental reasons uh, to subsidize. Um, another important reason, uh, maybe it's a little bit cursing here, but it's for commercial, commercial reasons. Um, a lot of donations are declining, um, especially in, in Holland, that's the, that's the case. So I th really think we should need to think about um, uh, even business modeling, maybe. Uh, and um, this morning it was already stipulated that uh, access to the uh, content, uh, especially also to audiovisual content, uh, is often a legal right in a lot of uh, countries. Um, like I said, I wanted to shift from the organizational perspective to the uh, user perspective. Um, there are, uh, I think there are a lot of classifications uh, for uh, typical users. Um, I borrowed one uh, from, um, uh, from one authors um, where they um, managed to, well, they divided five uh, kind of uh, user groups. Um, because I had to focus my research, uh, we said, okay, we wanted to investigate the general public, so the consumer side of, uh, um, of audiovisual heritage archives. Um, what I noticed uh, when I first started my PhD project is uh, there's a lot of um, um, technology or, or services are built from a technology point of view, which in literature they call technology push. Um, so from an organization, they get some funding, experimentation, uh, and building a technology and services and putting it just out. So it's also stipulated in literature. It's not the way to go if you want to have uh, successful services. So. What we did is try to change this per perspective and, um, uh, and, well, adhere to the paradigm of demand pool. So look at the uh, user and what's happening over there and look at their wishes and demands. This is a nice picture which is going around for a while on Twitter and uh, all these kind of social media. Um, I think it really stipulates the need. You can come up with a design like this. Uh, but the user, if it's not, it doesn't appeal to the user, it just goes around like that. So I think it really grasps the core why 
often the technology push uh, does not work and we should focus on the demand pool uh, paradigm. And by the way, today it's also uh, usability day in Berlin, so that's just a coincidence. So what we did is, okay, can we come up um, where we look at, okay, what drives people um, for to use an audiovisual heritage service? Um, at the moment of study, there was no broad service available online. Um, so what we did was, okay, let's say, so we posed a question to users, let's say there is uh, an online environment where you have access to um, the audiovisual heritage. So we come up with a proxy uh, which measures the intention to use, what they call in literature, um, and we'll say, okay, what, what motivates people to use uh, such a service? So in literature, you can say, okay, there are two uh, types of uh, motives which people drive when using a service, uh, which is on the one side, um, uh, extrinsic motivations, um, which is basically about the usefulness of an application. Um, uh, so for, um, um, for instance, Google is, well, it's, it's useful for us. Um, so that's the main reason to use it. Um, the other one is the more intrinsic uh, motivations, which is more about the enjoyment or the playfulness of a service. Uh, for instance, when you watch television, movie watching, it's more about intrinsic motivations that drives us to go there than it is useful to us, right? Um, so we said, okay, when, when, it's, when does it become useful then? Uh, so from the literature we derived these two things. Um, so you're expected to what we call novel expectancy, uh, which is like, okay, I gain new knowledge or I gain information for that. So that can drive the usefulness. Uh, the other one is the social expectancy, um, which is about sharing the content. Uh, but what drives then the, the enjoyment? When is something playful or something is enjoyable? Um, first of all, there's a self-reactive expectancy, which is about lean back, relaxing, passing time. Um, uh, so that can be of influence when you want to enjoy yourself. Uh, second of all, there's the status expectancy. Uh, for instance, um, a lot of people buy an iPhone because it's coolness factor. Um, so that can be of uh, that can be an intrinsic motivation, uh, and an important intrinsic motivation is the ease of use. So how easy can you use it, for instance? So this is basically my uh, empirical model, which I tried to uh, uh, investigate, and. Uh, we added uh, two kind of characteristics, which is one about uh, personal innovativeness, because there's no service there, uh, just like uh, the iPhone wasn't there in 2007, or in 2007 it got introduced. Um, a lot of people, a lot of innovators started using uh, that, so, but there's just a small amount. Uh, so we said, okay, it should be here because it's not there yet, so a lot of innovators, um, which is just a small amount, will use the service. Uh, second of all, there's uh, this thing called nostalgia proneness, uh, which is the feeling, uh, nostalgic feelings people uh, could have. We say, okay, maybe that is of influence of uh, using the service. Uh, and lastly, uh, we took into account some um, demographics, like age, gender, and uh, education and income. Uh, these are uh, the results, so I won't bother you with all the statistical uh, details. Uh, you can read it in my dissertation if you want. Um, but I will sum it up. Um, basically, we found out that people uh, with nostalgic feelings are more likely to use uh, a digital service. 
Uh, second of all, uh, these demo demographics, which is usually found to be the case for, uh, for, instance, uh, for instance, in uh, musea, are not of influence. So it doesn't matter if you're 40 or you're 21, you're interested in audiovisual heritage. Uh, second of all, uh, third of all, uh, enjoyment uh, is way more important than its usefulness. So a lot of what I notice, a lot of uh, organizations are striving for the, for the right metadata um, to uh, become useful. But for the user, it's way more important to enjoy and to have fun with the service. Uh, and lastly, um, this, this enjoyment is primarily influenced by its ease of use, apparently. So, Artificial heritage uh, is not, for the, at least for the consumer, is not something, okay, lean back and enjoy, uh, in that sense. It's mostly about, okay, how easy is the application uh, to use it. Um, what we also slightly did um, was looking at um, because a lot of, like I said, a lot of donations are declining now uh, from government. So what we also uh, posited to the respondents, okay, if you have such a service, are you willing to pay uh, for it? Um, these results should be taken a little bit carefully, um, but at least 77% said, okay, no way, I'm not gonna pay for it. Uh, but there's also uh, an amount almost one quarter that said, okay, I am willing to pay just uh, per uh, item or per content item, I am paying, uh, willing to pay a small amount, which is roughly about one or two euro. Um, and also uh, advertisements. So we asked the question, okay, does it bother you if we put in some advertisements uh, in front of the video? And almost 50% said, okay, I don't really care if you do that. Um, and lastly, we ask a little bit about the um, last business model you can uh, think of is uh, a subscription uh, model. Um, and also here, uh, well, almost 31% uh, said, okay, we're willing to pay a small fee per month. So I think that's not that bad. Um, so I want uh, to give you some takeaways uh, from this presentation. Uh, before the break. Um, I really would like to encourage you to put in the, the, the user uh, in, uh, as your focal point when providing access. Because you can design all kinds of things, but if, if the user doesn't uh, uh, use it, then it probably dies out in a couple of years. Um, also, an important thing is focus on the enjoyment and the playfulness of your service. So not only uh, putting the books out there or putting all your content online, you really have to engage the user into the content. Um, and lastly, um, try to th at least think about uh, business modeling. Okay, I think I'll leave it, uh, leave it there. So really, if you need to shape your access, try to at least more, do more research um, to your users in that sense. So I want to conclude with this uh, statement. Thanks. <laughs>